Good morning, good afternoon, everyone. This is Seb from Interface in the Chicago office. Thanks for joining me today in this Composer Tips and Tricks session. Before starting, just a quick reminder, please do not hesitate to ask any questions during the session using the Q&A toolbox from GoToWebinar up here or there. And we will try to answer them during the session in the chat or at the end of the session during the live Q&A. By the way, please tell stay till the end. I will need you during this live Q&A session. Please keep your smartphone close to you, ready to scan some QR codes. And I hope you will help me conclude this session nicely. Let's dive into our tips and tricks and start with some designer tips. Having a look at how to build some playlists using the maybe not known enough swap collection. Um, I want to share also some tips and tricks regarding the triggers and actions, which I actually use on every single day. Uh, they make me save quite a lot of time. And then see how to create some nice design effects using interface assets and value converters. So first, some swap collection and playlists. Here you can notice there was an image for just a few seconds. Now we have a video playing for about 12 seconds. The counter you may see on the top left corner just to give you an idea about what's going on behind the scene. Now we have again some images. I just put them to display for two seconds so it's easier to demonstrate. How would you build that in Composer? Actually, it is pretty easy. So let's have a look at this scene structure here. You will see here on the left, we do have our swap collection with one image first, then we have a video, and then three images. So basically, just create a swap collection, drag and drop your media, and you're good to go. Now, how do you define this timing and this automatic navigation? You notice the swap collection is selected here. If you look in the properties, we have the auto scroll checked. This will automatically scroll be between every single item you have in the collection. After two seconds, two seconds after entering the scene, and with a display duration item, an item display duration for two seconds, meaning every single image, every single PDF will be displayed for the same amount of time, except if you have videos and if you decide to autoplay them, they will be played for the length of their videos. So that's an easy way with some static content predefined in advance. You just put them in, comp in Composer. Uh, you can alternate images, videos, PDFs, uh, and you're good to go. Now, the swap collection is really well adapted to do that because it is meant to display one single item at a time. And you can then change the transition to decide if you want some crossfade between the items or some sliding effect like a website banner. What if you want to create something a bit more advanced with different durations for items with the content coming from an external data source? In this scenario, you can see again some images. Some will have a duration of two seconds, like the previous one. This one is for five seconds. Two seconds again, one, two, and five seconds again. So different duration for each item. And actually, in this case, the images are not Got, got and, uh, are not coming from Composer, right? We are retrieving them from an external data source, in this case, Airtable. Again, how would you build that? Let's have a look first at the database, super complex, uh, four rows, four images. And by the way, I'm using Airtable here. You could use Excel, you could use WordPress, whatever CMS you, you want to use. The only thing is we added here an additional field, which I should have called duration, actually. Uh, in which we're going to enter the time, the duration for each single item. So we have two seconds, five seconds, two and five. That's on the database side. So you assign duration to an item. If we look now into Composer, how, how does it work? Well, we still have a swap collection here, but you can notice now we have a data feed. We are retrieving the records from our database, from our table. And we have the, this image asset, which actually is going to be the template. So not on the swap collection. You can notice the blue line here. The selected object is the image URL itself. You can deactivate this use collection display duration property, meaning the items will are not going to use the general collection duration, the two seconds we had in the previous example. But we are going to affect a display duration for every single item. You can do that. And you could do it in Composer directly in the previous example, right? Setting a different duration for your items. Now, in here, we do have a data feed. So we can use a binding and retrieve the information from Airtable. You can see this time, again, wrongly named duration field. And we have a binding 
sending this value 205, 215 into the display duration. And the result is a scrolling, a looping collection where you have all your content for five seconds, this one, two seconds, the next one, etc. That's for the playlists. Uh, lots of various things you can do around that. Obviously, you would put this full screen. You could have some text in addition on top of the images. Uh, lots of possibilities. Next one, triggers copy and paste. So I'm still in play mode right now. I just want to go uh, show what's going on, what's the trigger, or what are the actions we're going to copy. So let's say we have an image asset here with an is tap trigger. So when I do a tap on the image, the action is, I don't know, an animation. And you build your experience like that, and then you realize, or I should say your graphic designer makes you realize, and the image, that's OK, but maybe you want to have an image button. So you do have um, some visual feedback. How do you move these triggers and actions from the image asset to the image button? So how do you duplicate or transfer some triggers and actions from an asset to another one, especially if they are not of the same type? We have an image, and we have a button. Let's switch to edit mode and triggers, copy and paste. <clears throat> so I'm going to show you two ways of doing it here. Uh, first one, the easy case. You have maybe one single trigger. The E is tapped on the left. You have one single action. That's the resize to factor. You can select your action. Notice the purple area here is on the right side. The action is selected. I can do a right click and do copy. Or if you're a keyboard addict like me, just use Control C. Then if we go to our image button, we will add a new trigger. The button is released. Click on the then side, right click, paste, you're good to go. That's kind of easy, right? You have only one action, copy and paste. That's pretty simple. I'm actually going to delete this one and show you a second case, right? So on the same image, I, I do have an additional trigger, which I use is double tap just to show something different. Where in here, we do have multiple actions, right? So if we try to uh, preview this, that would do something like move, zoom, zoom back, and go back to your original position. Obviously, this is just an example. Long story short, we do have one trigger. We have four actions. And I know some of you are building some pretty complex experiences where instead of four actions, you maybe would have a dozen of actions because you love animations. So in here, first option, with four that would work, with a dozen, eh, maybe not. You could select one action, hold the control key on your keyboard, and then select number two, number three, number four, etc. Go through the whole list, right click, copy, go on the button as we did earlier. That could work. Now, again, if you have more than four, if you have, or if you're like me, a little bit, a little bit impatient, uh, that might be something easier, right? So you can select the trigger on the left-hand side. If you copy a trigger, it will copy both the trigger and all its associated actions. So if I do this, I copy the is double tap trigger. And let me just add a fake image here. On the image, you can say paste. You can notice here on the image, we now have the same is double tap trigger with all the actions. That's OK, because we copy the trigger from an image to an image. Now, we wanted to do that on the image button, right? And the issue is, if I try to do it like right now, it's not going to work. Because if you look at an image button or a button, you don't have some tap trigger. You don't have is tap trigger. And this is where there's a little trick which I use a lot. Because I often start with an image, and then my graphic designer often tells me, put a button, please. Add some visual feedback, all right? So let's go back here to our trigger actions. We need to use actually a trigger which exists on both assets. So what I usually do is I just put a timer. And honestly, you don't really care about that. Copy the trigger. It will copy all your actions. Go on your image button. You can do a paste now. And then you have your trigger, which is the wrong one, but you have all your actions, which are the good ones. And that's the important thing here. And then select button is released. You have the proper trigger. You're good to go. 
and we can actually test that quickly. If I press and release, we have the four actions which are happening. Small thing, but if you, especially if you use keyboard uh, shortcuts and you have lots of actions, it can make you save a lot of time. All right, next topic, some nice design and animations using interface assets. Uh, how do you create a custom scroll bar? We've been asked this a lot on community and on support. So let me try to explain here to give you a way of doing that. First, we have a scroll collection here on the left. And you can notice the scroll percentage here on the left. And we have another scroll collection here on the right with uh, this circle moving along. The issue is when my scroll collection is at zero, I would like this to be at 100%. At 100 or I would need to play with the orientation and turn this upside down, not the easiest thing. So how do I make this movement apply to here. So if I'm at, let's say, 80%, I want to be at 20% on the other side and vice versa. You can do this with a binding and a little converter. So if we go into our scroll collection scene, we have the scroll bar here and you have the image scroll. Let's bind our vertical offset from the image scroll to the other one. And I'm going to use the same vertical offset. Now you can notice it jumped to the end because 100, 100. We want to do the opposite one. So on top of this binding, I can add a converter. And actually what we want to do here is to do 100% minus the input of the scroll bar. By doing this, when we move the scroll bar, it will move the scroll collection. If you do the same thing on the other side, so the scroll bar now becomes bound to the scroll collection with the same converter. So 100% minus the input of the other collection. You should be good. Let's test that. If I scroll the main collection, my scroll bar moves along. If I move my blue handle here, the scroll moves along. We're good. I used a custom script converter. This is a very tiny piece of JavaScript, super easy to, to write. We do have a lot of examples in the Help Center article, so check this out. Custom script converter. Let's go to the next one. And this one actually is when I um, stole from community. Thank you, Paolo, for sharing this tip with us. Uh, this is for you. So let me hit play. That's the thing. That's what you can do. And I'm just going to make this a little bit faster. Uh, let's go with 01 or with 001. And you can see now it's super, super fast. How does it work? Well, I won't go too much into the details because there, there is an article on community on community about that. But basically, Paolo has been using a timer, and the timer value is bound to this text input. So if we put, uh, for example, 1.5, this is going to be pretty slow. Every half seconds, a new character is going to appear. While if I add a zero here, it's going to be way faster. And then he used the text manipulation interface asset to do a substring, basically go from position zero to position a counter and to get this value and write it here. That's it. The timer, a substring method from the text manipulation interface set, and the binding on the timer for the duration. Pretty cool effect. Obviously, if you want to use that for real, you would put the text outside of the scene. You don't have a button. You have a specific trigger that launches this kind of animation. But you can do it in interface. Let's move on to the next tips. And let's try to talk about some integrator tips. For those who are working with external data sources, uh, like Excel, Airtable, uh, quick filtering trick I want to share with you, and then some good practices uh, regarding testing your work and how to control your experience from the web. 
So actually, I will have to go back to in edit mode for this one. So you might be familiar with the sample in the marketplace, uh, right? It is our uh, cursor restaurant menu. And I'm going to jump to the base actually first. So this is the list of all the products. And you can see we have section one, section two, section three, which is one main column and then the half column on the top, half column on the bottom. So how do you get the data from this single table and split it into three collections? Well, the first thing is on Airtable, you can create views where you do apply the filter at the Airtable level. Uh, you could do that in Excel by adding some uh, tabs in your Excel file to pre-filter the content. That's the easiest way to do. And here we are going to see how to duplicate your collections and do it pretty efficiently and pretty quickly. So in here, we do have this product section one. I'm going to add a new interface set using the API Explorer. I was running a bit late on the agenda. So this is the section two in your table. The important thing is when you do an import, make sure you have a different name. So we interface composer uh, doesn't merge uh, the, the different interfaces at. So we have this second source, and honestly, we don't really care about the collection itself. Because we are basically looking at different items from the same table, so they have the same structure, right? So what I can do is just duplicate this collection in here. And you can see we have the records of product section one. And when you have a data feed like this, you can change it directly in the properties up here. I will select product section two, and there you go. You have your objects for the section two. I could do exactly the same thing, add section three, just do duplicate like this, and change the data feed, and you're good to go. So creating multiple sections based on one single database using the filtering mechanism can again make you save a lot of time. And then on the back end, it's easier, simpler to maintain one single table and play with the views, especially in your table, to make sure that you're auditing the right content. The second thing is some test tools. Uh, and let me take the example here of same QSR example where based on the clock event, you want to display either the breakfast or the lunch menu. You're not going to wait till your clock reaches 12 p.m. to see if the trigger works properly or not. So usually what I do is I create an additional layer in which I will put only testing tools, meaning after the project is done, I can just clean the scene structure, delete the layer. I'm not deleting anything that matters in the experience. These are just for the test purposes. In these test tool layers, I do have a toggle button like this, which you could decide to put it in the scene if you want. Uh, and let me go in play mode and, and show you how it works. So I do have, that's a toggle button actually. Which one will really bring my group where I can play with the lunch. Okay, that works, I have the right content. Breakfast, that works, I'm good, I can put it back. Usually even this toggle button, I keep it outside, so if I need to do a screenshot session with a customer, or if I want to take a snapshot, I don't have any visual pollution. And then I use a space spacebar uh, keyboard trigger that will toggle the button itself. So that's pretty convenient. And just build your group, have a little animation moving out uh, that brings the tool you need. And obviously you can put as many buttons as you want in, in here, or text down to your web services responses depending on what you need to test, what you need to, to debug. That's pretty convenient. And again, separate layer, so you can keep things clean. The last tips is about how to control your experience content from the web. And I will just use the same example. So remember, we do have our products here, and I will just go into our section one. Let's say you have your backend and you want to make a change in one of the objects. Right now we have the first item here costs 10 bucks. You want to change the price that puts uh, 15. So we see the difference. How do you make this change real time? Well, you could have some 
polling mechanisms, meaning you check every hour, that's not real time, uh, on a regular basis. If it's some content which needs to be updated just every single day, that's good. That's a good approach. But if you want something more real time, like a price change or maybe an out of stock, right? Then the solution could be to use web triggers. And actually, again, in a table, uh, there's something which I discovered pretty recently. So that's why I wanted to share that with you. You can create objects which are buttons. And in this button, actually, you can open a URL, basically make an HTTP, an HTTP call, and you can use some web triggers. So in here, I do have my credential key entered. So when I'm going to press this button, remember we have the 10 bucks here. This is going to do a web trick to call a web trigger from a little web page which I developed, and I didn't even see it. It switched automatically to 15. The same way you could build something, and this is going to be the, the, the raw uh, API message, right? Uh, right now we are seeing the breakfast. If you want to manually have some buttons to force the lunch content, now all the content is switching. And you can see this is the, the raw API. Web trigger API call with the road JSON answer. Uh, if I want to switch back to the breakfast, then same thing. So right now I'm calling this API, this web trigger API from the Airtable button, but you could even build something using a nice big red physical button, IoT objects on the desk, which I used to have in our office to put the lunch menu at 15 past noon. Um, and here I do have some shortcuts which are going to do the same thing, right? So I do have the web trigger and don't worry about the API key. This will be deleted after the conference. So don't try to mess with my players. If I click on that, it's going to switch to the lunch. If I just click on breakfast, now it's controlling all my players and sending show the breakfast uh, menu on the scene. This concludes the tips and tricks session. Well, almost concludes. We are going to switch back to the live Q&A. And remember, please grab your smartphone. I'm going to ask you to scan a code and tell me what you thought of this session. See you there.